thousands of cars stolen every year. It's a crime that involves a lot of money. By devious thieves and high-tech heists. They're certainly using their brain power to get around things. Leaving victims to wonder how. I was just completely dumbfounded that it could happen. How many times has it changed hands? Kevin Newman. Cars are being driven off dealer lots. Investigates the shadowy world of organized auto theft. How often are you seeing these kinds of very high-tech thefts? Every day. The cons, the technology. This is what the thieves are using now. Ah, OK. And the determined cops out to put the brakes on the thieves. Fair enough, buddy. You're under arrest. And missing men spark desperate searches that ultimately leads police to a suspect. It's a serial killer. But uncovers something far more sinister. We were pointed in the direction of cannibalism. Avery Haynes with an exclusive W5 investigation. He helped police in Europe capture a cannibal that exposed a nightmare world. It looks like two limbs in a baking pan. Of unthinkable acts. They also came uh, better he has uh, experience with cannibalism. Where murder may just be the beginning. What were you offering? Myself as meat. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello and welcome to a brand new season of W5. And we're beginning with exclusive inside access to an ongoing criminal investigation into a type of theft that's on the rise nationwide. Organized criminal gangs are snatching cars and trucks off people's driveways and dealers' lots and then selling them to the black market overseas. As you're about to see, they're using some pretty sophisticated techniques that are tough to stop. In the driveway of this quiet and comfortable new subdivision north of Toronto sits a Toyota 4Runner. And over the next 20 minutes, the hooded man approaching it will steal it. Quietly, stealthily, they're somehow able to unlock the door, spark the ignition, and simply drive it away in the dead of night. The neighbors, the owner, didn't hear a thing. It wasn't until Ted Chan awoke the next morning, he realized he'd been robbed. I was shocked more than anything else. I didn't have time to register any anger. I was just completely dumbfounded that it could happen. Fortunately, his new home had a security system. He checked the video and saw what had happened and still feels violated. You said it still upsets you to see it? What upsets you? I think just seeing someone take something that's mine with relative ease was definitely upsetting, yeah. Ted had one thing going for him. His prized forerunner was stolen in Aurora, Ontario. And under the jurisdiction of the York Regional Police Department's Auto Cargo Theft Unit. It's a rare and elite team of detectives whose focus is to investigate large-scale auto theft involving organized criminal gangs. Some of them work undercover, so W5 has agreed to hide their identities. Detective Sergeant Paul LaSalle is the head of the unit. Why have you dedicated so much of your career to this kind of crime? It's a crime that, um, that most people don't know a heck of a lot about. It involves a lot of money, and the money's going towards uh, organized crime. One look at the surveillance video from Ted Chan, and police knew they were dealing with well-organized thieves with access to incredible technology. A handheld device able to hack into, and believe it or not, reprogram a vehicle's internal computer. This is what the thieves are using now. It's a, a real basic instrument that just simply plug it into the, uh, into the vehicle to be able to wow. program it. Uh, it needs to be equipped with hacked software for the particular car to be able to just to program a new key. How long does it typically take for the machine to talk to the car to give up its secret? It doesn't take very long for it to start the process, but it does have some codes that need to roll over, depending on what type of car it is. It can take anywhere, usually around the 10 minute mark. They typically plug it in and walk away. But meantime, the machine is grinding away, trying to figure out how to connect to the car. Right. Once the hack is done, the machine tells the car to connect to a blank fob that the thieves have brought, making it 
the car's new key. How often are you seeing these kinds of very high-tech thefts? Every day. Unfortunately, uh, with, with any technology, it's just a matter of time before someone figures out how to hack into the system. So it is happening all the time. Ted's forerunner wasn't the only high-end SUV to vanish in the middle of the night. Between October and December, we had upwards of approximately 25 high-end cars, all the same. We knew they were obviously targeting our area. We were able to get some sort of profile on where they were hitting and what they were doing time of day. Their profile was good. A few weeks later, police arrested and charged four men from the Ottawa and Montreal areas with multiple counts of theft of a motor vehicle and possession of property obtained by crime. Three of the men pleaded guilty. So in some ways, it used to be a, a physical crime. You'd jam to try to get in. Yep. Seems to be a much more cerebral crime now. It certainly is. They're, they're certainly using their, uh, their brain power to, to get around things. Hacking into your car's internal computer has made car theft a lot quieter and quicker. But there's an even easier way that organized crime is grabbing millions of dollars worth of high-end vehicles. And this technique eliminates the risk of being caught stealing off people's driveways. In the cases you're about to see, cars are being driven off dealer lots. It begins with fraudulent financing. And here's how it works. Someone known as a straw buyer goes into a dealership and applies for a big loan to buy an expensive car. Now, in some cases, the real people paid a few hundred bucks by the criminal gang to put the car in their name. Other times, these straw buyers use fake IDs and false information to apply for the loans. So it's usually their banking information is such as their employment. So they give them either a false T4, they give them a false letter from a false employer saying they're making X amount of money. So they will have documents sitting across from the loan officer that says, I am this person, which may be true, yep. but the income level probably is not true. No. Regardless of who the straw buyer is and how they got the financing, one thing is clear. They have no intention of ever paying the loan. All right, quick update on Sandstorm and where we're at. To combat this specialized fraud, the unit launched a task force seven months ago called Project Sandstorm. It identifies and keeps track of the suspect's targets and organization. Detective LaSalle agreed to bring W5 along on one of its surveillance missions. Our group is utilizing this loading location. So we're going to go down there and uh, see what we can see. Once a vehicle has been fraudulently financed, the thieves will often try to load them into a container and then ship them out of the country. Most of the vehicles in Project Sandstorm are destined for the United Arab Emirates. And what they'll do is they'll actually load the one car in, jack it up to the roof, load the next car underneath, and then do the same thing for the next two cars. That way they can maximize their profit. If police see vehicles they suspect are stolen being loaded into containers destined for one of Canada's ports, they'll flag the container and tip off the Canadian Border Services Agency to stop it. Take a look at what previous investigations have stopped from being sent overseas. Stolen BMWs stacked underneath other luxury brands. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth in each container. According to the CBSA, between October 2016 and June 2018, almost 600 stolen vehicles were seized at the border. But the dirty cars aren't always easy to spot. Take this vehicle, a stolen Lexus worth 80 grand. This police video shows it was stashed inside a container full of other legitimate car shipments. Luckily, police were able to grab the contraband car before it hit the water. So occasionally you have a way, I'm told, of uh, reminding people that you're on their tail. Yeah. Occasionally on uh, certain investigations that we want to poke the bear a little bit, and we'll put little toy cars in that empty container and we'll a little note from the police. 
I would have loved to have been on the other end when they open up their container and expect to see four luxury cars. And there's dinky toys instead. And, and there's little dinky toys in, in, instead. These don't sound like mom and pop operations. Oh, absolutely not. You can imagine the amount of money that they're getting away with prior to us getting out of them. It's crazy. Crazy like millions? Millions. Oh, absolutely. Millions. It's now daybreak on a hot and humid summer day, and the Project Sandstorm team has received some key intelligence. One of their suspects, who police say has been driving a fraudulently financed car, has been located in this sleepy suburb in the east end of Toronto. They've split up the team, and officers are on both ends of the city. One group is at an apartment complex in the west end, keeping eyes on the stolen Mercedes, which has been stashed here overnight. Detective Sergeant Paul LaSalle and Detective Scott Cresswell, whose face we've agreed to conceal, are about to execute a search warrant on the house connected to the suspect in the East End. 48 to 10 and 13, we're at the rise now, we're gonna be executing shortly. They enter the home, unsure if the suspect is there. Meanwhile, across town, two other officers wait, ready to make an arrest if the suspect is here with the stolen car. After about 10 minutes, police walk out of the house, their suspect in tow and under arrest. When we got in, our suspect was uh, sleeping in bed down the basement. Um, he was arrested. Uh, we got him to the division and then we were able to complete our search. Meantime, over in the underground garage, the two officers get word that the other team made the arrest. What's happening, Scotty? Is he getting held or bailing or uh, front end? The detectives seal up the Mercedes and have it towed back to police headquarters for fingerprinting and further examination. Later that afternoon, after an exhaustive search of the home, the police warrant has produced more than an arrest. Police say they've seized evidence crucial to their investigation. We were able to uh, locate a number of uh, documents related to the frauds. We had uh, banking documents uh, that were used to obtain false credit. We were able to seize false government documents. There was uh, residence cards in there with the same person's photograph with different names. The suspect has been charged with 19 offenses, including possession of property obtained by crime, uttering a forged credit application, and fraud exceeding $5,000. None of these charges have been proven in court. When you were able to pick off a couple of people in an organization like you're investigating, how quickly does it adapt to that? Yeah, they're pretty savvy on what's going on. The thing is, we know who they are. We know their MO to begin with. So uh, we'll be able to find out what they're doing, but it's just a, a matter of time and patience. Setting the trap. I've confirmed that car is a stolen vehicle. To get their man. Whoever's in that car is gonna get arrested and charged. When W5 continues. The York Regional Police Auto Cargo Theft Unit is one of the few police teams in Canada dedicated to investigating auto theft and organized crime. The investigation basically uh, started off with two warehouses that were... For the last seven months, Detective Sergeant Paul LaSalle and his team of 10 officers have been deep in an investigation of an organized car theft ring in the greater Toronto area. What are you learning about how this group is organized? This group appears to be tied to a lot of other cells. They're not necessarily working as one big organization. The investigation, dubbed Project Sandstorm, has been a huge undertaking for the unit. What is your estimation of where you are in that investigation? We've arrested a number of players. We ended up taking a lot of cars away from them at the ports. So I think so far we've seized about one and a half million dollars from these guys. To date, they've obtained 28 vehicles that have been fraudulently financed and destined for overseas. Vehicles like this one, a 2018 Toyota Tundra, which was seized at a spot the group is using to hide stolen vehicles. 
The Tundra was financed for $86,000, no money down, and no payment ever made. In this particular case, when we seized it, we didn't see who was driving it. So we're gonna have one of our forensic people dust it, possibly uh, take DNA samples and to be able to uh, prove who had possession of the vehicle. Ultimately, we wanna tie it to uh, one of our suspects. But at this point, our suspect pool is growing. So who knows who it's gonna come back to? Yeah, hopefully he gets lucky. It's early one morning in June, and police from the auto cargo theft unit have zeroed in on a target. They've been planning this day for weeks. I've confirmed that car is a stolen vehicle. We're gonna surveil that vehicle as it leaves the building. Detective Scott Cresswell is giving the team a rundown of what's ahead. W5 has agreed to hide some of their faces to protect their undercover work in exchange for being inside an ongoing investigation. The plan? Stake out an underground garage where they know a stolen Jeep is parked. So I believe that there's two parties that could be driving it. Whoever's in that car is going to get arrested and charged. Any questions, guys? The team splits up into five separate vehicles, each taking a different view. We stick with Detective Cresswell. I can definitely play call it North Confederation. Yeah, Roger, if you're gonna play North, uh, Jeff, I'll be ready to go South on Confederation, okay? Detective Creswell circles the area where the car is stashed, keeping an eye on the parking garage exit. Right. So do you have an idea of when he's likely to leave that apartment building? The suspects in this investigation often move around like 10, 11 in the morning. That's kind of their, their up and out. But the morning passes and there is no sign of the suspect anywhere near the stolen Jeep. So they wait. In the left turn lane. Yeah, he's there real antsy coming up to the switch. Finally, after more than five hours, the call comes in. They're connected to an island if you stop right here on the road. The Jeep is on the move and the officers spring into action. Yeah, Roger, can you see who's driving? the undercover cop cars quickly fall into line, tailing the stolen vehicle as it drives through downtown Mississauga. And now we're stopped for uh, the next red light here at Living Park and turning north. He's still in lane one. Greens are up, he's uh, through the intersection. This is it, buddy. If you can make it safe, do it. He's reversing into a spot here. We'll take him through the plugs, I'll block him. Within seconds, the officers have moved in on the suspect. Fair enough, buddy. You're under arrest. Yeah, you're under arrest for possession of stolen property, all right? What is that? This car. This car? This car. This car. What's wrong with this car? This car is a stolen car. Stolen car? Yeah, stolen car. Do so you, you understand you're under arrest? Kind of. You have the right to maintain silence, okay? You don't have to say anything right now. Okay. You're under arrest for possession of stolen property. So you got your suspect. What happens to him next? So he's going to be transported uh, by one of our uniform officers to our station in Vaughan, uh, where he'll be processed, he'll be interviewed, and then we'll see what happens at that point where we go from there. The suspect is charged with possession of stolen property over $5,000. This charge hasn't been proven in court. When police search the Jeep, they discover some important paperwork. We watched some evidence being recovered from the back seat of that vehicle. It looked like documentation. Are you able to tell us whether that was falsified? Yeah, there was some bank documents that were in what we believe to be straw buyers' names. Straw buyers, that's the term for people who apply for car loans, in some cases using fake IDs and false employment records, and get approved. Have you run across these straw buyers who have bought multiple cars? from different banks and different loaning agencies? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's a big problem in these type of investigations for the frauds. And then they're also smart to be able to line up deals all within a week. So they'll go to one dealership that deals with X bank. They'll deal, go to another dealership two days later that deals with Y bank. And then they'll go to another dealership that'll deal with Z bank. And none of the banks are talking to each other within a certain amount of time. If they're approved for $100,000, boom, 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 they may hit four or five. They got themselves a half million dollars in a week. That's amazing. Quick.
it seems to me that would be a pretty easy place to stop this from happening right there. I mean, what are the checks required to be able to confirm that this person has the kind of job that they say they have? Yeah, in some cases, a quick Google check of the supposed business that, that exists, a lot of times the address doesn't exist. It's supposed to be an apartment building with uh, like a high rise downtown and it's a parking lot or it's a fish and chip restaurant and it's supposed to be a, an accountant's firm. Some things could be checked very easily. So we were curious about how Canada's major lenders are trying to close these loopholes and protect their loans. We approached the Canadian Bankers Association, which represents the five big Canadian banks here on Bay Street, but they declined our request for an interview, saying they didn't have authority on the subject. So we went to Scotiabank, which is Canada's biggest bank for auto loans. We were curious about whether they were even tracking auto fraud financing, what their protocols are for vetting and approving loans. But they declined our request for an interview as well, citing security and privacy concerns. So with lenders staying silent, it's not clear how aggressively they're pursuing organized criminals and their dirty loans. Yet the work of the York Regional Police Auto Cargo Theft Unit proves that this crime can be disrupted and stopped, and a lot of cars and money recovered. This has largely been an invisible crime up to now. How big a dent in invisibility do you think your group's been able to make? I think over the number of years that we've, we've been managed to be able to recover millions of dollars every year. But when I think about the effort that our small unit has made, and it's, it's been fantastic, but the amount of stuff that we're missing has got to be tenfold. So, so what you're able to get is just really a tip of an iceberg. It really is. It really is. There's a lot of money out there unfortunately, going to bad people.